When the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock was first published in the Chicago-based magazine Poetry, it was so different, so odd, from the kinds of poetry that was being read and produced at the time, that even its defenders understood and misunderstood the poem in ways that seem strange to us who are so familiar with the poem. So to get at the reception history of Prufrock then, it's useful to consider the roles that Harriet Monroe and Ezra Pound played in bringing it to light. Monroe was the founder and editor of Poetry Magazine, and she was on the lookout for bright young talent. Pound was her foreign correspondent and talent scout, and they had a bitter disagreement about the meaning and significance of Prufrock, a poem that was written by an unknown graduate student whom Pound had met in London. The famous part of this story is Pound's discovery of Eliot. Arriving in London in August 1914, Eliot had called on Pound at his Kensington flat. Eliot sent Prufrock to Pound after that meeting, and Pound howled in excitement to Monroe afterwards. I was jolly well right about Eliot. He has sent in the best poem I have yet had or seen from an American. Pray God it be not a single and unique success. He is the only American I know of who has made what I can call adequate preparation for writing. He has actually trained himself and modernized himself on his own. Pound's amazement at Eliot's work has been construed in various ways, including the mischievous explanation that Pound was astonished that any poets could have modernized themselves without his help. Thereafter, Pound was Eliot's most important ally, and his first task was to get Harriet Monroe to publish Prufrock in her magazine. In his hectoring manner, Pound repeatedly assailed Monroe regarding what he took to be her foot dragging. These harangues by Pound are delightful for us to read, but it must surely have been irksome to be on their receiving end. Here are two examples. In November of 1914, Pound responded to Monroe, No, most emphatically, I will not ask Eliot to write down to any audience whatsoever. Neither will I send you Eliot's address in order that he may be insulted. And then in January 1915, in a crescendo of agitation, Pound again unloaded on Monroe. Now, as to Eliot, Mr. Prufrock does not go off at the end. It is a portrait of failure, or of a character which fails, and it would be false art to make it end on a note of triumph. I will let the unfortunate poem by Arthur Davison Fick pass without complaint if you get on with Mr. Prufrock in a nice, quiet, and orderly manner. The eight-month delay in publication is often read through this lens of Pound's bullying and Monroe's objections. But Monroe's delay in publication probably had little to do with her demurrals about the poem. The simpler explanation is backlog. Many authors of excellent reputation had to wait for longer periods at poetry, W.B. Yeats and William Carlos Williams among them. In her book on Harriet Monroe, the critic and historian Ellen Williams offers a subtle reading of the pound Monroe spat over Prufrock examining how both of them misconstrue its conclusion. Here, for example, is what Pound said of the final stanzas of the poem. The poetic mind leaps the gulf from the exterior world, the trivialities of Mr. Prufrock, diffident, ridiculous, in the drawing room. To us later readers of the poem, however, there is no escaping the Prufrockian mind that has defined the exterior and interior worlds. Ellen Williams comments, The drawing room world in Prufrock is ugly and trivial enough, but one wonders how Pound could feel that the poetic mind leaped out of it. In his reading of the poem, Pound's Prufrock is endowed with suspiciously Pound-like energies, remaking the world in his own image. For her part, Monroe projected her own anxieties and concerns onto the poem. As Ellen Williams describes her, Monroe would seem to have been the ideal reader for Prufrock. She had a pessimistic streak, 
with little faith in civilization. Ellen Williams argues that Monroe had the revolutionary temperament, despite her conventional situation, but the image of Prufrock, of a man denatured by his own civilization, but unable to escape from it, is abhorrent to that temperament. The way Eliot's conclusion denies Prufrock any escape from himself and suggests another level of reality in the sea only to deny it would be shocking to Harriet Monroe. As a consequence, Monroe's resistance to Prufrock took the form of biographical simplification, reducing the character's conundrum to the author's struggle with modernity. Monroe later described the poem as modern sophistication dealing with the tag ends of overworldly cosmopolitanism, which is an evasion of the poem at least as dubious as Pound's. Writing to Monroe two years after their quarrel, Pound reminds her that she had at first loathed and detested Eliot. This accusation is probably an exaggeration on Pound's part, but the truth is that she did dislike parts of Prufrock. In her later life, however, Monroe preferred to remember only her heroic publication of the poem rather than her initial objections to it. In her autobiography, she dissembles about her first encounter with Prufrock, recalling her impression of, quote, an extraordinarily finished product, a radical revision of her early characterization of the poems going off at the end. Her autobiography also peevishly erases Pound's role in the affair by reducing him to an anonymous servant. When Prufrock reached us via our foreign correspondent, its opening lines nearly took our breath away. However, we printed the poem in June 1915, thereby drawing down upon our heads loud protests from shocked critics. In spite of Pound and Monroe's disagreements about the poem, and in spite of their idiosyncratic understandings of it, the end result was that Eliot got his first major publication. And this professional triumph helped Eliot to screw his courage to the sticking place, to give up the safety of academia, and to claim his vocation as an artist.